Chapter 7 of The Temptation of St. Anthony by Gustav Flaubert Translated by Lafcadio Hearn This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison An exceedingly cold, opaque, and fetid mist fills the atmosphere. Antony, groping with his hands like a blind man, where am I? I fear lest I fall into the abyss and the cross. Surely it's too far from me. Oh, what a night! What a terrible night! The mist is parted by a gust of wind, and Antony sees two men covered with long white tunics. The first is of lofty stature, with a gentle face and a grave mien. His blonde hair parted like that of Christ, falls upon his shoulders. He has cast aside a wand that he had been holding in his hand. His companion takes it up, making a reverence after the fashion of the Orientals. The latter is small of stature, thick-set, flat-nosed. His neck and shoulders expresses good-natured simplicity. Both are barefooted, bareheaded, and dusty, like persons who have made a long journey. Antony, starting up, What do ye seek? Speak, or be gone from here. Damis, who is a little man, Nay, nay, be not angered, good hermit. As for that I seek, I know not myself what it is. Here is the master. He sits down. The other stranger remains standing, silence. Antony asks, Then ye come? Damis, oh, from afar off, oh, very far off. Antony, and ye go? Damis, pointing to the other. Whithersoever he shall desire. Antony, but who may he be? Damis, look well upon him. Antony, aside, he looks like a saint. If I could only dare. The mist is all gone. The night is very clear. The moon shines. Damis, of what art thou dreaming that thou dost not speak? Antony, I was thinking, oh, oh nothing. Damis approaches Apollonius and walks all round him several times, bending himself as he walks, never raising his head. Master, here is a Galilean hermit who desires to know the beginnings of wisdom. Apollonius, let him approach. Antony hesitates. Damis, approach. Apollonius, in a voice of thunder, approach, thou who wouldst know who I am what I have done, and what I think. Is it not so, child? Antony, always supposing that these things can contribute to the salvation of my soul. Apollonius, rejoice. I am about to inform thee of them. Damis, in an undertone to Antony, is it possible he must surely have at the first glance discerned in thee extraordinary aptitude for philosophy. I shall also strive to profit by his instruction. Apollonius, first of all, I shall tell thee of the long course which I have followed in order to obtain the doctrine, and if thou canst discover in all my life one evil action, Thou shalt bid me pause, for he who hath erred in his actions 
may well give scandal by his words damis to antony how just a man is he not antony indeed i believe him to be sincere apollonius upon the night of my birth my mother imagined that she was gathering flowers by the shore of a great lake a flash of lightning appeared and she brought me into the world to the music of the voices of swans singing to her in her dream until i had reached the age of fifteen i was plunged thrice a day into the fountain asbadeus whose waters make perjurers hydropical and my body was rubbed with the leaves of the onitsa that i might be chaste a palmyrian princess came one evening to seek me offering me treasures that she knew to be in the tombs a higher jewel of the temple of diana slew herself in despair with the sacrificial knife and the governor of cilicia finding all his promises of no avail cried out in the presence of my family that he would cause my death but it was he that died only three days after assassinated by the romans damis nudging antony with his elbow eh did i not tell thee oh what a man apollonius for the space of four successive years i maintained the unbroken silence of the pythagoreans the most sudden and unexpected pain never extorted a sigh from me and when i used to enter the theatre all drew away from me as from a phantom damis oh wouldst thou have done so much thou apollonius after the period of my trial had been accomplished i undertook to instruct the priests regarding the tradition they had lost antony uh, what tradition damis interrupt him not or be silent apollonius i have conversed with the samaneans of the ganges with the astrologers of chaldea with the magi of babylon with the gaulish druids with the priests of the negroes i have ascended the fourteen olympii i have sounded the scythian lakes i have measured the breadth of the desert damis it is all true i was with him the while apollonius but first i had visited the hyrcanian sea i made the tour of it and descending by way of the country of the Bariomati, where bucephalus is buried i approached the city of nineveh at the gates of the city a man drew near me thomas i even i good master i loved thee from the first thou wert gentler than a girl and more beautiful than a god apollonius without hearing him he asked me to accompany him that he might serve as interpreter damis but thou didst reply that all languages were familiar to thee and that thou couldst divine all thoughts then i kissed the hem of thy mantle and proceeded to walk behind thee apollonius after tessiphon we entered upon the territory of babylon damis and the satrap cried aloud on beholding a man so pale antony aside what signifies this apollonius the king received me standing near a throne of silver in a hall constellated with stars from the cupola hung suspended by invisible threads four great birds of gold with wings extended antony dreamily 
can there be such things in the world damis ah that is a city that babylon everybody there is rich the houses which are painted blue have doors of bronze and flights of steps descending to the river drawing lines upon the ground with his stick like that as seest thou and then there are temples there are squares there are baths there are aqueducts or the palaces are roofed with red brass and the interior oh if thou only knewest apollonius upon the north wall rises a tower which supports a second a third a fourth a fifth and there are also three others the eighth is a chapel containing a bed no one enters it save the woman chosen by the priests for the god belus i was lodged there by order of the king of babylon damis as for me they hardly deign to give me any attention so i walk through the streets all by myself i inform myself regarding the customs of the people i visited the workshops i examined the great machines that carry water to the gardens but i soon wearied of being separated from the master apollonius at last we left babylon and as we travelled by the light of the moon we suddenly beheld an empusa damis i indeed she leaped upon her iron hoof she brayed like an ass or she galloped among the rocks he shouted imprecations at her she disappeared antony aside what can be their motive apollonius at taxila the capital of five thousand fortresses phraortes king of the ganges showed us his guard of black men whose stature was five cubits and under a pavilion of green brocade in his gardens an enormous elephant which the queens amused themselves by perfuming it was the elephant of porus which had taken flight after the death of alexander damis and which had been found again in a forest antony their speech is superabundant like that of drunken men apollonius phraortes seated us at his own table damis how strange a country that was during their drinking carousals the lords used to amuse themselves by shooting arrows under the feet of a dancing child but i did not approve apollonius when i was ready to depart the king gave me a parasol and he said to me i have a stud of white camels upon the indus when thou shalt have no further use for them blow in their ears they will come back we descended along the river marching at night by the light of the fireflies which glimmered among the bamboos the slave whistled an air to drive away the serpents and our camels bent down in passing below the branches of the trees as if passing under low gates one day a black child who held a golden caduceus in his hand conducted us to the college of the sages iarchus their chief spoke to me of my ancestors told me of all my thoughts of all my actions of all my existences in former time he had been the river indus and he reminded me that i had once been a boatman upon the nile in the time of king sesostris damis as for me they tell me nothing so that i know not who or what i have been antony they have a vague look like shadows apollonius upon the shores of the sea we met with the milk god cynocephali who were returning from their expedition to the island taprobana the tepid waves rolled blonde pearls to our feet the amber crackled beneath our steps whale skeletons were whitening in the crevasses of the cliffs at last the land became narrow as a sandal and after casting drops of ocean water toward the sun we turned to the right to return so we returned 
through the region of aromatics by way of the country of the gangarides the promontory of camaria the country of the sachalites of the adramites and of the homemerites then across the cassanian mountains the red sea and the island topazos we penetrated into ethiopia through the country of the pygmies antony to himself how vast the world is damis and after we had returned home we found that all those whom we used to know were dead antony lowers his head silence apollonius continues then men began to talk of me the world over the plague was ravaging ephesus i made them stone an old mendicant there damis and forthwith the plague departed antony what does he drive away pestilence apollonius at Cnidos, i cursed the man that had become enamoured of venus damis i a fool who had even vowed to espouse her to love a woman is at least comprehensible but to love a statue oh what madness the master placed his hand upon the young man's heart and the fire of that love was at once extinguished antony how does he also cast out devils apollonius at tarentum they were carrying the dead body of a young girl to the funeral pyre damis the master touched her lips and she arose and called her mother antony what he raises the dead apollonius i predicted to vespasian his accession to power antony what he foretells the future damis at corinth there was a apollonius it was when i was at table with him at the waters of Baia. antony excuse me strangers it is very late damis at corinth there was a young man called menippus antony no no go ye away apollonius a dog came in bearing a severed hand in his mouth damis one evening in one of the suburbs he met a woman antony do ye not hear me be gone apollonius he wandered in a bewildered way around the couches antony enough apollonius they sought to drive him out damis so menippus went with her to her house they loved one another apollonius and gently beating the mosaic pavement with his tail he laid the severed hand upon the knees of flavius damis but next morning during the lessons in the school menippus was pale antony starting up in anger still continuing ah then let them continue till they be weary inasmuch as there is no damis the master said to him o oh, beautiful youth thou dost caress a serpent by a serpent thou art caressed and when shall be the nuptials we all went to the wedding antony assuredly i am doing wrong to hearken to such a story damis servants were hurrying to and fro in the vestibule doors were opening nevertheless there was no sound made either by the fall of the footsteps nor the closing of the doors the master placed himself beside menippus and the bride forthwith became angered against the philosophers but the vessels of gold the cupbearers the cooks the panthers disappeared the roof receded and vanished into air the walls crumbled down and apollonius stood alone with the woman at his feet all in tears she was a vampire who satisfied the beautiful young men in order to devour their flesh for nothing is more desirable for such phantoms than the blood of amorous youths apollonius if thou shouldst desire to learn the art antony i do not wish to learn anything apollonius the same evening that we arrived at the gates of rome antony oh yes speak to me rather of the city of popes apollonius 
a drunken man accosted us who was singing in a low voice the song was an epithalamium of nero and he had the power to cause the death of whosoever should hear it with indifference in a box upon his shoulders he carried a string taken from the emperor's cithara i shrugged my shoulders he flung mud in our faces then i unfastened my girdle and placed it in this hand damis in sooth oh thou wert most imprudent apollonius during the night the emperor summoned me to his house he was playing at oscillates with sporus supporting his left arm upon a table of agate he turned and knitting his brows demanded how comes it that thou dost not fear me because i replied the god who made thee terrible also made me intrepid antony to himself there is something inexplicable that terrifies me silence damis breaking the silence with his shrill voice moreover all asia can tell thee antony starting up i am ill oh let me be damis but listen at ephesus he beheld them killing domitian who was at rome antony with a forced laugh is it possible damis yes at the theatre at noonday the fourteenth of the calendar of october he suddenly cried out caesar is being murdered and from time to time he would continue to ejaculate he rolls upon the pavement oh how he struggles he rises he tries to flee the doors are fastened ah it is all over he is dead and in fact titus flavius domitianus was assassinated upon that very day as thou knowest antony without the aid of the devil certainly apollonius he had purposed putting me to death that same domitian damis had taken flight according to my order and i remained alone in my prison damis a terrible hardihood on my part it must be confessed apollonius about the fifth hour the soldiers led me before the tribunal i had my harangue all ready hidden beneath my mantle damis we others were then upon the shores of puteoli we believed thee dead we were all weeping when all of a sudden about the sixth hour thou didst suddenly appear before us exclaiming it is i antony to himself even as he damis in a very loud voice precisely antony oh no ye lie is it not so ye lie apollonius he descended from heaven i rise thither by the power of my virtue that has lifted me up even to the height of the principle of all things damis tyana his natal city has established in his honour a temple and a priesthood apollonius draws near antony and shouts in his ear it is because i know all gods all rites all prayers all oracles i have penetrated into the cave of Traponius, son of apollo i have kneaded for syracusan women the cakes which they carry to the mountains i have endured the eighty tests of mithra i have pressed to my heart the serpent of sabasius i have received the staff of kabirai i have laved sabeli in the waters of the campanian gulfs and i have passed three moons in the caverns of samothracia damis with a stupid laugh <laughs> at the mysteries of the good goddess apollonius and now we recommence our pilgrimage we go to the north to the land of swans and of snows upon the vast white plains the blind hippopodes break with the tips of their feet the ultramarine plant damis hasten it is already dawn the cock has crowed the horse has neighed the sail is hoisted antony the cock has not crowed 
i hear the locusts in the sands and i see the moon still in her place apollonius we go to the south beyond the mountains and the mighty waters to seek in perfumes the secret source of love thou shalt inhale the odour of merodion which makes the weak die thou shalt bathe thy body in the lake of rose oil which is in the island junonia thou shalt see slumbering upon primroses that lizard which awakes every hundred years when the carbuncle upon its forehead arriving at maturity falls to the ground the stars palpitate like eyes the cascades sing like the melody of lyres strange intoxication is exhaled by blossoming flowers thy mind shall grow vaster in that air and thy heart shall change even as thy face damis master it is time the wind has risen the swallows awaken the myrtle leaves are blown away apollonius yes let us go antony nay i remain here apollonius shall i tell thee where grows the plant balus that resurrects the dead damis nay ask him rather for the audradamas which attracts silver iron and brass antony oh how i suffer how i suffer damis thou shalt comprehend the voices of all living creatures the roarings the cooings apollonius i shall enable thee to ride upon unicorns and upon dragons upon hippocentaurs and dolphins antony weeping <laughs> apollonius thou shalt know the demons that dwell in the caverns the demons that mutter in the woods the demons that move in the waves the demons that push the clouds damis tighten thy girdle fasten thy sandals apollonius i shall explain to thee the reason of divine forms why apollo stands why jupiter is seated why venus is black at corinth square shaped at athens conical at paphos antony clasping his hands let them be gone let them be gone apollonius in thy presence i will tear down the panoplies of the gods we shall force open the sanctuaries i will enable thee to violate the pythoness antony help oh my god he rushes to the cross apollonius what is thy desire what is thy dream thou needst only devote the moment of time necessary to think of it antony jesus jesus help me apollonius dost thou wish me to make him appear thy jesus antony what how apollonius it shall be he no other he will cast off his crown and we shall converse face to face damis in an undertone say thou dost indeed wish it say thou dost desire it antony kneeling before the cross murmurs prayers damis walks around him with wheedling gestures nay oh nay good hermit be not horrified these are only exaggerated forms of speech borrowed from the orientals or oh, they need in no way apollonius let him alone damis he believes like a brute in the reality of things the terror which he entertains of the gods prevents him from comprehending them and he debases his own god to the level of a jealous king but thou my son do not leave me he moves to the edge of the cliff walking backward passes beyond the verge of the precipice and remains suspended in air above all forms farther than the ends of the earth 
beyond the heavens themselves lies the world of idea replete with the splendour of the word with one bound we shall traverse the impending spaces and thou shalt behold in all his infinity the eternal the absolute the being come give me thy hand let us rise side by side both rise up through the air slowly antony clinging to the cross watches them rise they disappear End of chapter 7chapter eight of the temptation of saint anthony by gustav flaubert translated by lafcadio hearn this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony addison five anthony walking to and fro slowly that one indeed seems in himself equal to all the powers of hell nebuchadnezzar did not so much dazzle me with his splendours or the queen of sheba herself charmed me less deeply his manner of speaking of the gods compels one to feel a desire to know them i remember having beheld hundreds of them at one time in the island of elephantius in the time of diocletian the emperor had ceded to the nomads a great tract of country upon the condition that they should guard the frontiers and the treaty was concluded in the name of the powers invisible for the gods of each people were unknown unto the other people the barbarians had brought theirs with them they occupied the sand-hills bordering the river we saw them supporting their idols in their arms like great paralytic children others paddling through the cataracts upon trunks of palm tree displayed from afar off the amulets hung about their necks the tattooings upon their breasts and these things were not more sinful than the religion of the greeks the asiatics and the romans when i was dwelling in the temple of heliopolis i would often consider the things i beheld upon the walls vultures bearing sceptres crocodiles playing upon lyres faces of men with the bodies of serpents cow-headed women prostrating themselves before ithyphallic gods and their supernatural forms attracted my thoughts to other worlds i longed to know that which drew the gaze of all those calm and mysterious eyes if matter can exert such power it must surely contain a spirit the souls of the gods are attached to their images those possessing the beauty of forms might seduce but the others those of loathsome or terrible aspect how can men believe in them and he beholds passing over the surface of the ground leaves stones shells branches of trees then a variety of hydropical dwarfs these are gods he bursts into a laugh he hears another laugh behind him and hilarion appears in the garb of a hermit far taller than before colossal Antony, who feels no surprise at seeing him how stupid one must be to worship such things hilarion i exceedingly stupid then idols of all nations and of all epochs of wood of metal of granite of feathers of skin sewn together pass before them the most ancient of all anterior to the deluge are hidden under masses of seaweed hanging down over them like manes 
some that are too long for their bases crack in all their joints and break their own backs in walking others have rents torn in their bellies through which sand trickles out antony and hilarion are prodigiously amused they hold their sides for laughter then appear sheep-headed idols they totter upon their bandy legs half open their eyelids and stutter like the dumb ba 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 the more that the idols commence to resemble the human forms the more they irritate antony he strikes them with his fist kicks them attacks them with fury they become frightful with lofty plumes eyes like balls fingers terminated by claws the jaws of sharks and before these gods men are slaughtered upon altars of stone others are brayed alive in huge mortars crushed under chariots nailed upon trees there is one all of red-hot iron with the horns of a bull who devours children antony horror hilarion but the gods always demand tortures and suffering even thine desired antony weeping ah say no more do not speak to me the space girdled by the rocks suddenly changes into a valley a herd of cattle are feeding upon the short grass the herdsman who leads them observes a cloud and in a sharp voice shouts out words of command as if to heaven hilarion because he needs rain he seeks by certain chance to compel the king of heaven to open the fecund cloud antony laughing verily such pride is the extreme of foolishness hilarion why dost thou utter exorcisms the valley changes into a sea of milk motionless and infinite in its midst floats a long cradle formed by the coils of a serpent whose many curving heads shade like a dais the god slumbering upon its body he is beardless young more beautiful than a girl and covered with diaphanous veils the pearls of his tiara gleam softly like moons a chaplet of stars is entwined many times about his breast and with one hand beneath his head he slumbers with the look of one who dreams after wine a woman crouching at his feet awaits the moment of his awaking hilarion such is the primordial duality of the brahmins the absolute being inexpressible by any form from the navel of the god has grown the stem of a lotus flower it blossoms and within its chalice appears another god with three faces antony how strange an invention hilarion father son and holy spirit are but one and the same person the three faces separate and three great gods appear the first who is pink bites the end of his great toe the second who is blue uplifts his four arms the third who is green wears a necklace of human skulls before them instantly arise three goddesses one is enveloped in a net another offers a cup the third brandishes a bow and these gods these goddesses decouple themselves multiply arms grow from their shoulders 
at the end of these arms hands appear bearing standards axes bucklers swords parasols and drums fountains gush from their heads plants grow from their nostrils riding upon birds rocked in palanquins and throned upon seats of gold standing in ivory niches they dream voyage command drink wine respire the breath of flowers dancing girls whirl in the dance giants pursue monsters at the entrances of grottoes solitaries meditate eyes cannot be distinguished from stars nor clouds from banderoles peacocks quench their thirst at rivers of gold dust the embroidery of pavilions seems to blend with the spots of leopards coloured rays intercross in the blue air together with flying arrows and swinging censers and all this develops like a lofty frieze resting its base upon the rocks and rising to the sky antony dazzled by the sight how vast is their number what do they seek hilarion the god who rubs his abdomen with his elephant trunk is the solar deity the inspiring spirit of wisdom that other whose six heads are crowned with towers and whose fourteen arms wield javelins is the prince of armies of the fire consumer the old man riding the crocodile washes the soul of the dead upon the shore they will be tormented by that black woman with the putrid teeth who is the ruler of hell that chariot drawn by red mares driven by one who has no legs bears the master of the sun through heaven's azure the moon god accompanies him in a litter drawn by three gazelles kneeling upon the back of a parrot the goddess of beauty presents to love her son her rounded breast behold her now further off leaping for joy in the meadows oh look look coif with dazzling mitre she trips lightly over the ears of growing wheat over the waves she rises in air extending her power over all elements and among these gods are the genii of the winds of the planets of the months of the days a hundred thousand others multiple are their aspects rapid their transformations behold there is one who changes from a fish into a tortoise he assumes the form of a boar the shape of a dwarf antony wherefore hilarion that he may preserve the equilibrium of the universe and combat the works of evil but life exhausts itself forms wear away and they must achieve progression in their metamorphoses all upon a sudden appears a naked man seated in the midst of the sand with legs crossed a large halo vibrates suspended in air behind him the little ringlets of his black hair in which bluish tints shift symmetrically surround a protuberance upon the summit of his skull his arms which are very long hang down against his sides his two hands rest flat upon his thighs with the palms open the soles of his feet are like the faces of two blazing suns and he remains completely motionless before antony and hilarion with all the gods around him rising in tears above the rocks as if upon the benches of some vast circus his lips half open 
and he speaks in a deep voice. I am the master of great charities, the succor of all creatures, and not less to the profane than to believers do I expound the law, that I might deliver the world. I resolved to be born among men. The gods wept when I departed from them. I sought me first a woman worthy to give me birth, a woman of warrior race, the wife of a king exceedingly good, excessively beautiful, with body firm as adamant, and a time of the full moon, without the auxiliation of any male, I entered her womb. I issued from it by the right side. Stars stopped in their courses. Hilarion murmurs between his teeth, and, seeing the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Antony watches more attentively the buddha continuing from the furthest recesses of the himalayas a holy man one hundred years of age hurried to see me hilarion a man named simeon who should not see death before he had seen the christ of the lord the buddha i was led unto the schools and it was found that I knew more than the teachers. Hilarion, in the midst of the doctors, and all that heard him were astonished at his wisdom. Antony makes a sign to Hilarion to be silent. The Buddha, continually did I meditate in the gardens. The shadows of the trees turned with the turning of the sun, but the shadow of that which sheltered me turned not. None could equal me in the knowledge of the scriptures, the enumeration of atoms, the conduct of elephants, the working of wax, astronomy, poetry, pugilism, all the exercises and all the arts. In accordance with custom, I took to myself a wife, and I passed the days in my kingly palace, clad in pearls, under a rain of perfumes, refreshed by the fans of thirty thousand women. Watching my peoples from the height of my terraces, adorned with fringes of resonant bells. But the sight of the miseries of the world turned me away from pleasure i fled i begged my way upon the high roads clad myself in rags gathered within the sepulchres and hearing of a most learned hermit i chose to become his slave i guarded his gate i washed his feet thus i annihilated all sensation all joy all languor then concentrating my thoughts within vaster meditation i learned to know the essence of things the illusion of forms soon i exhausted the science of the brahmans they are gnawed by covetousness and desire under their outward aspect of austerity they daub themselves with filth they live upon thorns hoping to arrive at happiness by the path of death. Hilarion, Pharisees, hypocrites, whited sepulchres, generation of vipers. The Buddha, I also accomplished wondrous things, eating but one grain of rice each day, and the grains of rice in those times were no larger than at present. My hair fell off, my body became black, my eyes receding within their sockets, seemed even as stars beheld at the bottom of a well. During six years I kept myself motionless, exposed to the flies, the lions and the serpents, and the great summer suns, the torrential rains, 
lightnings and snows, hails and tempests, all of these I endured without even the shelter of my lifted hand. The travellers who passed by, believing me dead, cast clods of earth upon me. Only the temptation of the devil remained. I summoned him. His sons came, hideous, scale-covered, nauseous as charnel-houses, shrieking, hissing, bellowing, interclashing their panoplies, rattling together the bones of dead men. Some belched flame through their nostrils, some made darkness about me with their wings, some wore chaplets of severed fingers, some drank serpent venom from the hollows of their hands. They were swine-headed, they were rhinoceros-headed, or toad-headed. They assumed all forms that inspire loathing or affright. Antony, to himself, I also endured all that in other days. The Buddha. Then did he send me his daughters, beautiful with daintily painted faces and wearing girdles of gold. Their teeth were whiter than the jasmine flower, their thighs round as the trunk of an elephant. Some extended their arms and yawned that they might so display the dimples of their elbows. Some winked their eyes, some laughed, some half opened their garments. There were blushing virgins, matrons replete with dignity, queens who came with great trains of baggage and of slaves. Antony aside, ah, he too, the Buddha, having vanquished the demon, I nourished myself for twelve years with perfumes only, and as I had acquired the five virtues, the five faculties, the ten forces, the eighteen substances, and had entered into the four spheres of the invisible world, intelligence became mine, I became the Buddha. All the gods, bow themselves down. Those having several heads bend them all simultaneously. He lifts his mighty hand aloft and resumes. That I might effect the deliverance of beings, I have made hundreds of thousands of sacrifices. To the poor I gave robes of silk, beds, chariots, houses, heaps of gold and of diamonds. I gave my hands to the one-handed, my legs to the lame, my eyes to the blind, even my head I severed for the sake of the decapitated. In the day that I was king, I gave away provinces. When I was a Brahmin, I despised no one. When I was a solitary, I spake kindly word to the robber who slew me. When I was a tiger, I allowed myself to die of hunger, and having in this last existence preached the law, nothing now remains for me to do. The great period is accomplished. Men, animals, the gods, the bamboos, the oceans, the mountains, the sand grains of the Ganges, together with the myriad myriads of the stars all shall die and until the time of the new births a flame shall dance upon the wrecks of worlds destroyed then a great dizziness comes upon the gods they stagger fall into convulsions and vomit forth their existences their crowns burst apart their banners fly away they tear off their attributes their sexes fling over their shoulders the cups from which they quaffed immortality, strangle themselves with their serpents, vanish in smoke, 
and when all have disappeared hilarion solemnly exclaims thou hast even now beheld the belief of many hundreds of millions of men antony is prostrate upon the ground covering his face with his hands hilarion with his back turned to the cross stands near him and watches him end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of the Temptation of Saint Anthony by Gustav Flaubert, translated by Lafcadio Hearn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. A considerable time elapses. Then a singular being appears, having the head of a man upon the body of a fish. He approaches through the air upright, beating the sand from time to time with his tail, and the patriarchal aspect of his face, by contrast with his puny little arms, causes Antony to laugh. Awanes, in a plaintive voice, Respect me. I am the contemporary of beginnings. I dwelt in that formless world where hermaphroditic creatures slumbered under the weight of an opaque atmosphere in the deeps of dark waters when fingers fins and wings were blended and eyes without heads were floating like mollusks among human-headed bulls and dog-footed serpents above the whole of these beings amoro kept bent like a hoop extended her woman body but belus cleft her in two halves with one he made the earth with the other heaven and the two equal worlds do mutually contemplate each other i the first consciousness of chaos arose from the abyss that i might harden matter and give a law unto forms also i taught men to fish and to sow i gave them knowledge of writing and of the history of the gods since then i have dwelt in the deep pools left by the deluge but the desert grows vaster about them the winds cast sand into them the sun devours them and i die upon my couch of slime gazing at the stars through the water thither i return he leaps and disappears in the nile hilarion that is an ancient god of the chaldeans antony ironically what then were those of babylon hilarion thou canst behold them and they find themselves upon the platform of a lofty quadrangular tower dominating six other towers which narrowing as they rise form one monstrous pyramid far below a great black mass is visible the city doubtless extending over the plains the air is cold the sky darkly bloom multitudes of stars palpitate above in the midst of the platform rises a column of white stone priests in linen robes pass and repass around it so as to describe by their evolutions a moving circle and with faces uplifted they gaze upon the stars Hilarion, pointing out several of these stars to Antony. There are thirty principal stars. Fifteen look upon the upper side of the earth. Fifteen below. At regular intervals, one shoots from the upper regions to those below, 
while another abandons the inferior deeps to rise to sublime altitudes of the seven planets two are beneficent two evil three ambiguous all things in the world depend upon the influence of these eternal fires according to their position or movement presages may be drawn and here thou dost tread the most venerable place upon earth here pythagoras and zoroaster have met here for twelve thousand years these men have observed the skies that they might better learn to know the gods antony the stars are not gods hilarion ay they say the stars are gods for all things about us pass away the heavens only remain immutable as eternity antony yet there is a master hilarion pointing to the column he belus the first ray the sun the male the other whom he fecundates is beneath him antony beholds a garden illuminated by lamps he finds himself in the midst of the crowd in an avenue of cypress trees to right and left are little pathways leading to huts constructed within a wood of pomegranate trees and enclosed by trilages of bamboo most of the men wear pointed caps and garments bedizened like the plumage of a peacock but there are also people from the north clad in bearskins nomads wearing mantles of brown wool pallid gangrides with long earrings and there seems to be as much confusion of rank as there is confusion of nations for sailors and stone-cutters elbow the princes who wear tiaras blazing with carbuncles and who carry long canes with carven knobs all proceed upon their way with dilated nostrils absorbed by the same desire from time to time they draw aside to make way for some long-covered wagon drawn by oxen or some ass jolting upon his back a woman bundled up in thick veils who finally disappears in the direction of the cabins antony feels afraid he half resolves to turn back but an unutterable curiosity takes possession of him and draws him on at the foot of the cypress trees there are ranks of women squatting upon deerskins all wearing in lieu of diadem a plaited billet of ropes some magnificently attired loudly call upon the passers-by others more timid seek to veil their faces with their arms while some matron standing behind them their mother doubtless exhorts them others their heads veiled with a black shawl and their bodies entirely nude seem from afar off to be statues of flesh as soon as a man has thrown some money upon their knees they arise and the sound of kisses is heard under the foliage sometimes a great sharp cry hilarion these are the virgins of babylon who prostitute themselves to the goddess antony what goddess hilarion behold her and he shows him at the further end of the avenue upon the threshold of an illuminated grotto a block of stone representing a woman antony ignominy how abominable to give a sex to god hilarion thou thyself dost figure him in thy mind as a living person antony again finds himself in darkness he beholds in the air a luminous circle 
poised upon horizontal wings this ring of light girdles like a loose belt the waist of a little man wearing a mitre upon his head and carrying a wreath in his hand the lower part of his figure is completely concealed by immense feathers outspreading about him like a petticoat it is ormuzd the god of the persians he hovers in the air above crying aloud i fear i can see his monstrous jaws i did vanquish thee o Arimum, but again thou dost war against me first revolting against me thou didst destroy the eldest of the creatures Kaiomorts, the man bull then didst thou seduce the first human couple messia and messiane and thou didst fill all hearts with darkness thou didst urge thy battalions against heaven i also had mine own the people of the stars and from the height of my throne i contemplated the marshalling of the astral hosts mitra my son dwelt in heavens inaccessible there he received souls from thence did he send them forth and he arose each morning to pour forth the abundance of his riches the earth reflected the splendour of the firmament fire blazed upon the crests of the mountains symbolizing that other fire of which i had created all creatures and that the holy flame might not be polluted the bodies of the dead were not burned the beaks of birds carried them aloft toward heaven i gave to men the laws regulating pastures labour the choice of wood for the sacrifices the form of cups the words to be uttered in hours of sleeplessness and my priests unceasingly offered up prayers so that worship might be as the eternity of god in its endlessness men purified themselves with water loaves were offered upon the altars sins were confessed aloud homer gave himself to men to be drank that they might have his strength communicated to them while the genii of heaven were combating the demons the children of iran were pursuing the serpents the king whom an innumerable host of courtiers served upon their knees represented me in his person and wore my coiffure his gardens had the magnificence of a heaven upon earth and his tomb represented him in the act of slaying a monster emblem of good destroying evil for it was destined that i should one day definitely conquer Ariman by the aid of time without limits but the interval between us disappears the deep night rises to me ye amshashbams ye ezeds ye feroes succour me mithra cease thy sword and thou chaosayak who shall return for the universal deliverance defend me what none to aid ah oh, i die thou art the victor ariman hilarion standing behind antony restrains a cry of joy and almost is swallowed up in the darkness then appears the great diana of ephesus black with enamelled eyes her elbows pressed to her side her forearms extended with hands open lions crawl upon her shoulders fruits flowers and stars intercross upon her bosom further down three rows of breasts appear and from her belly to her feet she is covered with a tightly fitting sheet from which bulls stags griffins and bees seem about to spring their bodies half protruding from it she is illuminated by the white light emanating from a disk of silver round as the full moon placed behind her head where is my temple where are my amazons what is this i feel 
i the incorruptible a strange faintness comes upon me her flowers wither her overripe fruits become detached and fall the lions and the bulls hang their heads the deer foam at the mouth with a slimy foam as though exhausted the buzzing bees die upon the ground she presses her breasts one after the other all are empty but under a desperate effort her sheath bursts she seizes it by the bottom like the skirt of a robe throws her animals her fruits her flowers into it then withdraws into the darkness and afar off there are voices murmuring growling roaring bellowing belling the density of the night is augmented by breaths drops of warm rain fall antony how sweet the odour of the palm trees the trembling of leaves the transparency of springs i feel the desire to lie flat upon the earth that i might feel her against my heart and my life would be reinvigorated by her eternal youth he hears the sound of castanets and of cymbals and men appear clad in white tunics with red stripes leading through the midst of a rustic crowd an ass richly harnessed its tail decorated with knots of ribbons and its hoofs painted a box covered with a saddle-cloth of yellow material shakes to and fro upon its back between two baskets one receives the offerings contributed eggs grapes pears cheeses fowls little coins and the other basket is full of roses which the leaders of the ass pluck to pieces as they walk before the animal shedding the leaves upon the ground they wear earrings and large mantles their locks are plaited their cheeks painted olive wreaths are fastened upon their foreheads by medallions bearing figurines all wear poniards in their belts and brandish ebony-handled whips having three thongs to which oscillates are attached those who form the rear of the procession place upon the soil so as to remain upright as a candelabrum a tall pine which burns at its summit and shades under its lower branches a lamb the ass halts the saddle-cloth is removed underneath appears a second covering of black felt then one of the men in white tunics begins to dance rattling his cortali another kneeling before the box beats a tambourine and the oldest of the band begins here is the good goddess the idaean of the mountains the great mother of syria come ye hither good people all she gives joy to men she heals the sick she sends inheritances she satisfies the hunger of love we bear her through the land rain or shine in fair weather or in foul of times we lie in the open air and our table is not always well served robbers dwell in the woods wild beasts rush from their caverns slippery paths border the precipices behold her behold her they lift off the covering and a box is seen inlaid with little pebbles loftier than the cedars she looks down from the blue ether vaster than the wind she encircles the world her breath is exhaled by the nostrils of tigers the rumbling of her voice is heard beneath the volcanoes her wrath is the tempest the pallor of her face has whitened the moon she ripens the harvest by her the tree bark swells with sap she makes the beard to grow give her something for she hates the avaricious the box opens and under a little pavilion of blue silk 
appears a small image of Sibeli, glittering with spangles, crowned with towers, and seated in a chariot of red stone, drawn by two lions with uplifted paws. The crowd presses forward to see. The Archigallus continues. She loves the sound of resounding tympanums, the echo of dancing feet, the howling of wolves, the sonorous mountains and the deep gorges, the flower of the almond tree, the pomegranate and the green fig, the whirling dance, the snoring flute, the sugary sap, the salty tear, blood, to thee, to thee, mother of the mountains. They scourge themselves with their whips, and their chests resound with the blows. The skins of the tambourines vibrate almost to bursting. They seize their knives, they gash their arms. She is sorrowful, let us be sorrowful, thereby your sins will be remitted. Blood purifies all, fling its red drops abroad like blossoms. She, the great mother, demands the blood of another creature, of a pure being. The Archigallus raises his knife above the head of a lamb. Antony, seized with horror, do not slay the lamb. There is a gush of purple blood. The priest sprinkles the crowd with it, and all, including Antony and Hilarion, standing around the burning tree, silently watch the last palpitations of the victim. A woman comes forth from the midst of the priests. She resembles exactly the image within the little box. She pauses, perceiving before her a young man wearing a Phrygian cap. His thighs are covered with a pair of narrow trousers, with lozenge-shaped openings here and there at regular intervals, closed by bow-knots of coloured material. He stands in an attitude of languor, resting his elbow against a branch of the tree, holding a flute in his hand. Sibeli, flinging her arms about his waist, I have traversed all regions of the earth to join thee, and famine ravaged the field. Thou hast deceived me. It matters not. I love thee. Warm my body in thine embrace. Let us be united. Atis. The springtime will never again return, O eternal mother. Despite my love, it is no longer possible for me to penetrate thy essence. Would that I might cover myself with a painted robe like thine. I envy thy breasts, swelling with milk, the length of thy tresses, thy vast flanks that are born and brought forth all creatures. Why am I not thou? Why am I not a woman? No, never depart from me. My virility fills me with horror. With a sharp stone, he dismembers himself and runs furiously from her. The priests imitate the god. The faithful do even as the priests. Men and women exchange garments, embrace, and the tumult of bleeding flesh passes away while the sound of voices remaining becomes even more strident like the shrieking of mourners like the voices heard at funerals a huge catafalque hung with purple supports upon its summit an ebony bed surrounded by torches and baskets of silver filigree in which are verdant leaves of lettuce mallow and fennel upon the steps of the construction from summit to base sit women all clad in black with loosened girdles and bare feet holding in their hands with a melancholy air great bouquets of flowers at each corner of the estrade urns of alabaster filled with myrrh slowly sent up their smoke upon the bed can be perceived the corpse of a man. Blood flows from his thigh. One of his arms hangs down lifelessly, and a dog licks his fingernails and howls. The row of torches placed closely together prevents his face from being seen, and Antony feels a strange anguish within him. He fears lest he should recognize someone. The sobs of the women cease, and after an interval of silence. 
all psalmody together fair fair oh fair he is thou hast slept enough lift thy head arise inhale the perfume of our flowers narcissus blossoms and anemones gathered in thine own gardens to please thee arouse thee thou dost make us fear for thee speak to us what dost thou desire wilt thou drink wine wilt thou lie in our beds dost wish to eat the honey cakes which have the form of little birds let us press his lips kiss his breast now now dost thou not feel our ring-laden fingers passing over thy body and our lips that seek thy mouth and our tresses that sweep thy thighs o faint god deaf to our prayers they cry aloud and run their faces with their nails then all rush and the howling of the dog continues in the silence alas alas woe the black blood trickles over his snowy flesh see his knees rise his sides sink in the bloom of his face has dampened the purple he is dead dead oh weep for him lament for him in long procession they ascend to lay between the torches the offerings of their several tresses that seem from afar off like serpents black or blonde and the catafalque is lowered gently to the level of a grotto the opening of a shadowy sepulchre that yawns behind it then a woman bends over the corpse her long hair uncut envelops her from head to feet she sheds tears so abundantly that her grief cannot be as that of the others but more than any man's infinite antony dreams of the mother of jesus she speaks thou didst emerge from the orient and didst take me all trembling with the dew into thy arms o son doves fluttered upon the azure of thy mantle Akises evoked low breezes among the foliage, and I abandoned myself wholly to thy love, delighting in the pleasure of my weakness. Alas, alas, why didst thou depart to run upon the mountains? A boar did wound thee at the time of the autumnal equinox. Thou art dead, and the fountains weep, the trees bend down, the wind of winter whistles through the naked brushwood my eyes are about to close seeing that darkness covers them now thou dwellest in the underworld near the mightiest of my rivals o oh, persephone all that is beautiful descends to thee never to return even while she speaks her companions lift the dead to place him within the sepulchre he remains in their hands it was only a waxen corpse wherefore antony feels something resembling relief all vanish and the hut the rocks and the cross reappear end of chapter nine chapter ten of the temptation of saint antony by gustav flaubert Translated by Lafcadio Hearn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. But upon the other side of the Nile, Antony beholds a woman standing in the midst of the desert. She retains in her hand the lower part of a long black veil that hides all her face supporting with her left arm a little child to whom she is giving suck a great ape crouches down in the sand beside her she uplifts her head toward heaven and in spite of the great distance her voice is distinctly heard isis oh neath beginning of all things amon lord of eternity bata demi ergos thoth his intelligence gods of the amanthi particular triads of the nomes falcons in the azure of heaven sphinxes before the temples ibises 
perched between the horns of oxen planets constellations shore murmurs of the wind gleams of the light tell me where i may find osiris i have sought him in all the canals and all the lakes i further yet even to phoenician biblos anubis with ears pricked up leaped about me and yelped and thrust his muzzle searchingly into the tufts of the tamarinds thanks good cynocephalus thanks to thee she gives the ape two or three friendly little taps upon the head hideous typhon the red-haired slew him tore him in pieces we have found all his members but i have not that which rendered me fecund she utters wild lamentations antony is filled with fury he casts stones at her reviles her be gone thou shameless one be gone hilarion nay respect her her religion was the faith of thy fathers thou didst wear her amulets when thou wert a child in the cradle isis in the summers of long ago the inundation drove the impure beasts into the desert the dikes were opened the boats dashed against each other the panting earth drank the river with the intoxication of joy then o oh god with the horns of the bull thou didst lie upon my breast and then was heard the lowings of the eternal cow the seasons of sowing and reaping of threshing and of vintage followed each other in regular order with the years in the eternal purity of the nights broad stars beamed and glowed the days were bathed in never varying splendour like a royal couple the sun and the moon appeared simultaneously at either end of the horizon then did we both reign above a sublimer world twin monarchs wedded within the womb of eternity he bearing a concupa-headed sceptre i the sceptre that is tipped with a lotus flower both of us erect with hands joined and the crumblings of empires affected not our attitude egypt extended below us monumental and awful long shaped like the corridor of a temple with obelisks on the right pyramids on the left and its labyrinth in the midst and everywhere were avenues of monsters forests of columns massive pylons flanking gates summit crowned with the mysterious globe the globe of the world between two wings the animals of her zodiac also existed in her pasture lands and filled her mysterious writing with their forms and colours divided into twelve regions as the year is divided into twelve months each month each day also having its own god she reproduced the immutable order of heaven and man even in dying changed not his face but saturated with perfumes invulnerable to decay he lay down to sleep for three thousand years in another and silent egypt and that egypt vaster than the egypt of the living extended beneath the earth thither one descended by dark stairways leading into halls where were represented the joys of the good the tortures of the wicked all that passes in the third and invisible world ranged along the wall the dead in their painted coffins awaited their turn and the soul exempted from migrations continued its heavy slumber until the awakening into a new life nevertheless 
Osiris sometimes came to see me, and by his ghost I became the mother of Hippocrates. She contemplates the child. Ay, it is he. Those are his eyes, those are his locks, plaited into ram horns. Thou shalt recommence his works. We shall bloom again like the lotus. I am still the great Isis. None has yet lifted my veil. My fruit is the sun, sun of springtime. Clouds now obscure thy face. The breath of Typhon devours the pyramids. But a little while ago I beheld the sphinx flee away. He was galloping like a jackal. I look for my priests, my priests clad in mantles of linen, with their great harps, and bearing a mysterious bark, adorned with silver pateras. There are no more festivals upon the lakes, no more illuminations in my delta, no more cups of milk at Philae. Apis has long ceased to reappear. Egypt, Egypt, thy great motionless gods have their shoulders already whitened by the dung of birds, and the wind that passes over the desert rolls with it and the ashes of thy dead. Anubis, guardian of ghosts, abandon me not. The Sinocephalos has vanished. She shakes her child. But what ails thee? Thy hands are cold, thy head droops. Harpocrates expires. Then she cries aloud, with a cry so piercing, funereal, heart-rending, that Antony answers it with another cry, extending his arms as to support her. She is no longer there. He lowers his face, overwhelmed by shame. All that he has seen becomes confused within his mind. It is like the bewilderment of travel, the illness of drunkenness. He wishes to hate, but a vague and vast pity fills his heart. He begins to weep, and weeps abundantly. Hilarion. What makes thee sorrowful? Antony, after having long sought within himself for a reply. I think of all the souls that have been lost through these false gods. Hilarion. Dost thou not think that they, sometimes, bear much resemblance to the true? Antony. That is but a device of the devil to seduce the faithful more easily. He attacks the strong through the mind, the weak through the flesh. Hilarion. But luxury in its greatest fury, has all the disinterestedness of penitence. The frenzied love of the body accelerates the destruction thereof, and proclaims the extent of the impossible by the exposition of the body's weakness. Antony, what signifies that to me? My heart sickens with disgust of these beautiful bestial gods, for ever busied with carnages and incest. Hilarion. Yet I recollect all those things in the scripture which scandalize thee, because thou art unable to comprehend them. So also may these gods conceal under their sinful forms some mighty truth. There are more of them yet to be seen. Look around. Antony, no, no, it is dangerous. Hilarion. But a little while ago thou didst desire to know them. Is it because thy faith might vacillate in the presence of lies? Or what fearest thou? The rocks fronting Antony have become as a mountain. A line of clouds obscures the mountain halfway between summit and base and above the clouds appears another mountain, enormous or green, unequally hollowed by valleys nestling in its slopes, and supporting at its summit, in the midst of laurel groves, a palace of bronze, roofed with tiles of gold, and supported by columns having capitals of ivory. 
in the centre of the peristyle jupiter colossal with torso nude holds victory in one hand his thunderbolts in the other and his eagle perched between his feet rears its head juno seated near him rolls her large eyes beneath a diadem whence her wind-blown veil escapes like a vapour behind them minerva standing upon a pedestal leans on her spear the skin of the gorgon covers her breast and a linen peplos falls in regular folds to the nails of her toes her glaucous eyes which gleam beneath her visor gaze afar off attentively on the right of the palace the aged neptune bestrides a dolphin beating with its fins a vast azure expanse which may be sea or sky for the perspective of the ocean seems a continuation of the blue ether the two elements are interblended on the other side weird pluto in night-black mantle crowned with diamond tiara and bearing a sceptre of ebony sits in the midst of an islet surrounded by the circumvolutions of the styx and this river of shadow empties itself into the darknesses which form a vast black gulf below the cliff a bottomless abyss mars clad in brass brandishes as in wrath his broad shield and his sword hercules leaning upon his club gazes at him from below apollo his face ablaze with light grasps with outstretched right arm the reins of four white horses urged to a gallop and ceres in her ox-drawn chariot advances toward him with a sickle in her hand behind her comes bacchus riding in a very low chariot gently drawn by lynxes plump and beardless with vine leaves garlanding his brow he passes by holding in his hand an overflowing cup of wine silenus riding beside him reels upon his ass pan of the pointed ears blows upon his syrinx the mimelonaiades beat drums the minads strew flowers the bacantes turn in the dance with heads thrown back and hair dishevelled diana with tunic tucked up issues from the wood together with her nymphs at the further end of a cavern vulcan among his cabiri hammers the heated iron here and there the aged rivers leaning recumbent upon green rocks pour water from their urns the muses stand singing in the valleys the hours all of equal stature link hands and mercury passes obliquely upon a rainbow with his caducius winged sandals and winged petasus but at the summit of the stairway of the gods among clouds soft as down from whose turning volutes a rain of roses falls venus anadiomene stands gazing at herself in a mirror her eyes move languorously beneath their slumberous lids she has masses of rich blond hair rolling down over her shoulders her breasts are small her waist is slender her hips curve out like the sweeping curves of a lyre her thighs are perfectly rounded there are dimples about her knees her feet are delicate a butterfly hovers near her mouth the splendour of her body makes her neck 
nacreous tinted halo of bright light about her while all the rest of olympus is bathed in a pink dawn rising gradually to the heights of the blue sky antony ah my heart swells a joy never known before thrills me to the depths of my soul how beautiful how beautiful it is hilarion they leaned from the heights of cloud to direct the way of swords one used to meet them upon the high roads men had them in their houses and this familiarity divinized life life's aim was only to be free and beautiful nobility of attitude was facilitated by the looseness of garments the voice of the orator trained by the sea rolled its sonorous waves against the porticoes of marble the ephebus anointed with oil wrestled all naked in the full light of the sun the holiest of actions was to expose perfection of forms to all and these men respected wives aged men suppliants behind the temple of hercules there was an altar erected to pity victims were immolated with flowers wreathed about the fingers of the sacrificer even memory was exempted from thoughts of the rottenness of death nothing remained but a little pile of ashes and the soul mingling with the boundless ether rose up to god bending to whisper in antony's ear and they still live the emperor constantine adores apollo thou wilt find the trinity in samothracian mysteries baptism in the religion of isis redemption in the faith of mithra a martyrdom of a god in the festivals of bacchus proserpine is the virgin aristias is jesus antony remains a while with downcast eyes as if in deep thought then suddenly repeats aloud the symbol of jerusalem as he remembers it uttering a long sigh between each phrase i believe in one only god the father and in one only lord jesus christ the first-born son of god who was incarnated and made man who was crucified and buried who ascended into heaven who will come to judge the living and the dead of whose kingdom there shall be no end and in one holy spirit and in one baptism of repentance and in one holy catholic church and in the resurrection of the flesh and in the life everlasting immediately the cross becomes loftier and loftier it pierces the clouds and casts its shadow upon the heaven of the gods all grow pale olympus shudders and at its base antony beholds vast bodies enchained sustaining the rocks upon their shoulders giant figures half buried in the deeps of caverns these are the titans the giants the hecatonchires the cyclops a voice rises indistinct and awful like the far roar of leaves like the voice of forests in time of tempests like the mighty moaning of the wind among the precipices we knew these things we knew them there must come an end even for the gods uranus was mutilated by saturn saturn by jupiter and jupiter himself shall be annihilated each in his turn it is destiny and little by little they sink into the mountain 
and disappear meanwhile the golden tiles of the palace rise and fly away jupiter has descended from his throne at his feet the thunderbolts lie smoking like burning coals about to expire and the great eagle bends its neck to pick up its falling feathers then i am no longer the master of all things most holy most mighty god of the patriarchs and greek peoples ancestor of all the kings agamemnon of heaven eagle of apotheoses what wind from erebus has wafted thee to me or fleeing from the campus martins dost thou bear me the soul of the last of the emperors i no longer desire to receive those of men let the earth keep them and let them move upon the level of its baseness their hearts are now the hearts of slaves they forget injuries forget their ancestors forget their oaths and everywhere the folly of crowds the mediocrity of individuals the hideousness of races hold sway he pants with such violence that his sides seem ready to burst asunder he clenches his hands weeping he be him a cup he seizes it no no so long as there shall be a brain enclosing a thought in whatsoever part of the world so long as there shall exist a mind hating disorder creating law so long will the spirit of jupiter live but the cup is empty he turns its edge down over his thumbnail not one drop left when the ambrosia fails the immortals must indeed depart the cup drops from his hands and he leans against a column feeling himself about to die juno thou shouldst not have had so many amours eagle bull swan rain of gold cloud and flame thou didst assume all forms dissipate thy light in all elements lose thy hair upon all beds this time the divorce is irrevocable and our domination our very existence dissolved she passes away in air minerva has no longer her spear and the ravens nesting among the sculptures of the friezes wheel about her pecking at her helmet let me see whether my vessels cleave the bright sea returning to my three ports let me discover why the fields are deserted and learn what the daughters of athens are now doing in the month of hecatomion my whole people came to worship me under the guidance of their magistrates and priests then all in white robes and wearing chitons of gold they advanced the long line of virgins bearing cups baskets parasols then the three hundred sacrificial oxen and the old men having green boughs the soldiers with clashing of armour the ephebi singing hymns flute players lyre players rhapsodists dancing women and lastly attached to the mast of a trireme mounted upon a wheel my great veil embroidered by virgins who had been nourished in a particular way for a whole year and when it had been displayed in all the streets in all the squares and before the temples in the midst of the ever chanting procession it was borne step by step up the hill of the acropolis grazed the propylaea and entered the parthenon but a strange feebleness comes upon me me the industrious one what what not one idea comes to me lo i am trembling more than a woman she turns beholds a ruin behind her utters a cry and stricken by a fallen fragment falls backward upon the ground hercules has flung away his lion skin and with feet firmly braced back arched teeth clenched he exhausts himself in immeasurable efforts to bear up the mass of crumbling olympus i vanquished the circopes the amazons and the centaurs many were the kings i slew i broke the horn of the great river Achelous. i cut the mountains asunder i freed nations from slavery and i peopled lands that were desolate i travelled through the countries of gaul i traversed the deserts where thirst prevails i defended the gods from their enemies and i freed myself from omphale 
but the weight of olympus is too great for me my arms grow feebler i die he is crushed beneath the ruins pluto it is thy fault amphitryonad wherefore didst thou descend into my empire the vulture that gnaws the entrails of titius lifted its head the lips of tantalus were moistened the wheel of ixion stopped meanwhile the kyres extended their claws to snatch back the escaping ghosts the furies tore the serpents of their locks and cerberus fettered by thee with a chain sounded the death rattle in his throat and foamed at all his three mouths thou didst leave the gate ajar others have come the daylight of men has entered into tartarus he sinks into the darkness neptune my trident can no longer call up the tempests the monsters that terrified of old lie rotting at the bottom of the sea amphitrite whose white feet crept lightly over the foam the green nereids seen afar off in the horizon the scaly sirens who stopped the passing vessels to tell stories and the ancient tritons mightily blowing upon their shells all have passed away all is desolate and dead the gaiety of the great sea is no more he vanishes beneath the azure diana clad in black and surrounded by her dogs which have been changed into wolves the freedom of the deep forests once intoxicated me the odours of the wild beasts and the exhalations of the marshes made me as one drunk with joy but the women whose maternity i protected now bring dead children into the world the moon trembles with the incantations of witches desires of violence of immensity seize me fill me i wish to drink poisons to lose myself in vapours in dreams and a passing cloud carries her away mars unhelmed and covered with blood at first i fought alone single-handed i would provoke a whole army by my insults caring nothing for countries or nations demanding battle for the pleasure of carnage alone afterward i had comrades they marched to the sound of flutes in good order with equal step respiring above their bucklers with plumes loftily nodding lances oblique then on rushed to battle with mighty eagle cries war was joyous as a banquet three hundred men strove against all asia but the barbarians are returning by myriads they come by millions ah since numbers and engines and cunning are stronger than valour it were better that i die the death of the brave he kills himself vulcan sponging the sweat from his limbs the world is growing cold the source of heat must be nourished the volcanoes and rivers are flowing metal underground strike harder with full swing of the arms with might and main the kabiri wound themselves with their hammers blind themselves with sparks and groping lose themselves in the darkness ceres standing in her chariot impelled by wheels having wings at their hubs stop stop or oh, it was with good reason that the exclusion of strangers atheists epicureans and christians was commended now the mystery of the basket has been unveiled the sanctuary profaned all is lost she descends a precipitous slope shrieking despairing tearing her hair ah oh, lies lies that era has not been restored to me the voice of brass calls me to the dead this is another tartarus whence there is no return horror the abyss engulfs her bacchus with a frenzied laugh what matters it the archon's wife is my spouse the law itself reels in drunkenness to me the new song the multiplied forms the fire by which my mother was devoured flows in my veins let it burn yet more fiercely even though i perish male and female complacent to all i abandon myself to you bacchantes i abandon myself to you bacchanalians and the vine shall twine herself about the tree trunks howl 
dance writhe loosen the tiger and the slave rend flesh with ferocious bitings and pan silenus the bacantes the mimolonaides and the mynads with their serpents torches sable masks cast flowers at each other shake their tympanums strike their thyrsi pelt each other with shells devour grapes strangle a goat and tear bacchus asunder apollo furiously whipping his coursers while his blanching locks are falling from his head i have left far behind me stony delos so pure that all now there seems dead and i must strive to reach delphi ere its inspiring vapour be wholly lost the mule's brows in its laurel groves the pythoness has wandered away and cannot be found by a stronger concentration of my power i will obtain sublime hymns eternal monuments and all matter will be penetrated by the vibrations of my cithara he strikes the strings of the instrument they burst lashing his face with their broken ends he flings the cithara away and furiously whipping his quadriga cries no enough of forms further higher to the very summit to the realm of pure thought but the horses back rear dash the chariot to pieces entangled by the harness caught by the fragments of the broken pole he falls head foremost into the abyss the sky is darkened venus blue with cold shivering once with my girdle i made all the horizon of hellas her fields glowed with the roses of my cheeks her shores were outlined after the fashion of my lips and her mountains whiter than my doves pulpitated beneath the hands of the statuaries my spirit's manifestation was found in the ordinances of the festivals in the arrangement of coiffures, in the dialogues of philosophers, in the constitution of republics. But I have doted too much upon men. It is love that has dishonoured me. She casts herself back, weeping. This world is abominable. There is no air for me to breathe. O oh, Mercury, inventor of the lyre, conductor of souls, take me away. She places one finger upon her lip and describing an immense parabola, falls into the abyss. End of chapter 10